This is a collection of railroad posters and prints bought at an auction 20 years ago. The small one on the top was made by an artist named Griffin, while the one at the bottom is a colorful image used for advertising or promotions. Both prints are not signed and are in the range of $25 each. The large poster on the left is from the World's Trade Fair held in New York in 1939, and Railroads on Parade was a major part of the event. Moreover, the last poster explained the Railroads on Parade event in detail, and on the bottom is a picture of an old railroad in the 1830s, and on the right is a more recent train. This poster would sell between eight and $1,200. However, the large poster has colorful graphics and was signed by an artist named Leslie Reagan, who was working with the New York Central Railroad in the 1930s. An auction estimate for this poster would be around... Auction estimate would be $3,000 to $4,000. Wow. That would be just for this piece. Wow. Two flamingos encased in glass plaque purchased from a neighbor at $2 are brought in for appraisal. This item was probably made in the 1920s through sandblasting and was later painted with oil paint. It started out as a utilitarian functional decorative piece but has grown to become a piece of decorative art. Without a doubt, this is a very collectible piece and at an auction would be worth around... We believe that if it came to auction it would probably sell somewhere between two and four thousand dollars. Very good. Imagine carrying the likeness of a loved one in your pocket during the 18th century. The miniature portrait showcased on the show exemplifies this historical practice. The item has been cherished by the guest family for generations, and it depicts her great-great-great-grandfather, Samuel Osgood. Osgood was an American merchant and statesman. Osgood is the first postmaster general to George Washington. He's a member of the, the Continental Congress and he led a regiment of militiamen in the, at Lexington Concord. Moreover, the portrait is painted in watercolor on a thin silver of ivory. On the back of the item, there's a compartment containing a lock of hair from the guest's ancestor. This portrait has a fascinating provenance and is estimated to be worth... I would say this um, would be worth about ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Really? A beautiful pendant watch with its necklace is brought in for appraisal. Also presented is the receipt of purchase from 1960 when the piece was bought for $1,250. The pendant is made of natural pearls and has an enamel. This is achieved by engraving on the metal, followed by a translucent enamel placed on top. The engraving comes through when the color is revealed. When the pendant is flipped over, there is the watch, which happens to be signed by Tiffany & Company. The watch was made for Tiffany by the Patek Philippe Company. Although some years back, this piece would have been sold for four to $6,000 because it was manufactured in the early 1900s. But at an auction today, it would be worth around... Today, at auction, um, this is easy, $8,000 to $10,000. Really? And that's an auction price. That's very nice. We are presented with a captivating poster and photograph that capture the spirit of the World War I era. What you have here are two pieces of pretty scarce ephemera related to World War I. These two items were discovered by the guest in his father's attic after his passing. The photograph, dated 1917, depicts the Minnesota Home Guard, 16th Battalion. It was taken with a circuit camera which uses a lens on a track to capture yard-long photographs. Additionally, we have a poster from 1919 advertising a concert by the 16th Home Guard Music Band. Items like these are extremely rare and often do not survive this long. This pair of rare artifacts offers us a glimpse into the past and would command an auction value of... The pair would bring about $2,000. Wow. So, not bad for an attic fan, not right? Not at all, not bad at all. This micro mosaic and Pietra Dura table is a stunning artifact with a rich history. I was the only one in my generation, so I inherited everything that my aunt owned. The tabletop was likely brought back from a grand tour of Italy, and it features a captivating scene of St. Peter's Square in the Vatican, intricately crafted using micro mosaic techniques. 
Each tiny piece of the mosaic is a small piece of glass meticulously assembled to create a detailed and vibrant image. Surrounding the central scene is a border of pietra dura, meaning hard stone in Italian. This intricate inlay work incorporates various types of marble, including rose-colored scagliola, a painted material made from ground marble. This kind of decoration was being made in the, the Vatican workshops, which are still going today. This detailed carving and form of the stand enhanced the overall elegance of the piece, and it's valued at... I would say a table like this at auction would probably have an estimate of ten dollars to $15,000. Wow. Oh, well, thank you. Today's treasure hunt find, a mysterious bracelet. Could it be Bakelite? Experts say weight and texture are key clues. This one feels interesting. At the auction house, Bakelite can be valuable, depending on its rarity. How much did you pay for this? $10. Let's see, this one has just one color, no carvings, and no fancy layering. But don't worry, simple can still be stylish and hold value. Now the big question is, is it really Bakelite? Here's a simple test. We just need hot water and a brave nose. Dip the bracelet in, then take a whiff. Bakelite has a unique, not so pleasant smell. And sniff, sniff, it smells awful. That's a good sign this is Bakelite. Since it's simple, the value is? I would value this at three to five hundred dollars. What do you think? I think I did very well. The maker of this exquisite piece paid serious attention to detail. The box has been in my family for as long as I can remember. I see pictures of it even during the time uh, when I was a baby. This piece is a French porcelain box, which is a beautiful family heirloom, cherished for its elegance and the intriguing story behind it. The box's actual origins are somewhat different, but still fascinating. It dates back to around 1900, indicated by its highly shiny glaze, pristine white porcelain, and the bleeding turquoise glaze along the edge. Additionally, this box features a finely detailed scene on the top and exquisite floral decorations on the inside, showcasing the artistry of early 20th century French porcelain. Despite its Sèvres-like marks, it's confirmed to be a later creation and not from the 18th century. Now, Sèvres did not use these particular marks in the 20th century, so it's not a Sèvres piece. Its beauty and craftsmanship make it a lovely addition to any collection and is worth... If it were Sèvres, and if it were 18th century, which is what the mark would indicate if it were, you're looking at anywhere from about $5,000 upwards. As it is, you're looking at somewhere around $300. Really? Very interesting. This oil painting is a captivating piece with a poignant history. She painted this while she was a patient in Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 1930s. Which reflects the tumultuous life and artistic journey of its creator, Zelda Fitzgerald, known as the beautiful Southern Belle and a significant figure of the Jazz Age. Her life, marked by glamour and eventual tragedy, saw her influenced by modernist painters during her time in Europe. Despite her struggles with mental illness, which led her to various institutions, Zelda became an accomplished painter, using art as a means of expression and therapy. She died tragically in a fire in 1948 in a mental institution. This particular painting, depicting nasturtiums, is an oil on canvas. It is in reasonably good condition and showcases Zelda's distinctive style and talent. This painting's rarity and the compelling evidence supporting its authenticity make it a valuable piece that's worth... In today's market, a conservative auction estimate on this painting would be between $10,000 and $15,000. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. Well, thank you. These sets of vintage Pennsylvania Crocs whisper a tale of their rich heritage. Originating from the 1880s, these Crocs are notable for their exceptional size, each holding 20 gallons, which is rare compared to the more common two or three gallon varieties. The creation of such large stoneware crocs was a demanding process. It required a significant amount of clay and involved two men, one to operate the kick wheel and the other to shape the vessel. These crocs were fired in kilns for approximately 17 hours, followed by a three-day cooling period. 
Once completed, they were transported on large ferry boats or sold locally. One of these crocs is marked R.T. Williams, indicating it was crafted by the well-known potter Richard Williams. This particular piece features both stencil and freehand decorations that are worth... The value on this is about $6,000. Okay. And this is probably worth in the range of $7,000 to $10,000. That's wonderful. This one piece. Wonderful. Here is a trench art musical instrument discovered in an antique shop by this guest. What sets this piece apart is its origin as trench art, a form of creative expression developed by convalescing soldiers during World War I. These soldiers, recovering from their injuries, crafted various objects to pass the time and maintain their mental well-being. Common trench art items include decorated artillery shells, bullets, cigarette lighters, and cases. However, a musical instrument fashioned from brass shells is exceptionally rare. This particular instrument is dated September 20, 1917, and bears the name of the likely maker. Apparently, he may have been a musical instrument maker before right. the war because he knew how to fabricate a musical instrument, especially out of brass from military casings. Given the increasing popularity of trench art among collectors, this instrument is valued at... I would estimate it... 500 maybe six seven hundred dollars oh, when it comes to porcelain and pottery the chinese are one of the leading countries and this vase is a great example of their craftsmanship the vase is made of porcelain and its enamel work while not the tightest is well executed also the painted enamel in relief known as moriagi adds texture that can be felt with a finger which indicates its high quality now there are some signs of both age and uh, a removal from the very best quality of enamel uh, to porcelain. As seen, this face features a yellow ground adorned with Indian lotus flowers and auspicious mushroom forms called ruri or lingzi, along with scrolling leaves. The alternating cartouches depict celestial landscapes and typical Chinese themes, including scholars within rock work and ladies of beauty in gardens. This mark would indicate that it is a Chinese vase. This is a Qinlong mark. Uh, it's a mark that corresponds to an 18th century wow. dynasty. At auction, this vase that represents the artistry of its maker would sell for... Now we, we come to value. In a retail setting, this vase would carry a price tag of twelve to $15,000. Wow. <laughs> That's more than I thought. This pottery bowl hails from northern New Mexico and is a creation of the renowned potter Tonita Roybel. Tonita, known for her exceptional pottery work, was married to Juan Cruz Roybel, who was a notable Pueblo painter. The collaborative effort between them is evident in this bowl, where Tonita skillfully formed the pottery and Juan adorned it with his intricate paintings. The bowl exemplifies the rich cultural heritage and artistic traditions of the Rio Grande Pueblos. Its craftsmanship and historical significance contribute to its value, and it is worth... Its value would probably be in the $1,500 range. It's a great pot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, nice to Thank you very much. This guest inherited this chair from her grandmother, and it holds deep sentimental value and historical background. This chair is a remarkable example of early American craftsmanship which represents a school of chair makers that began in the late 1600s. It is characterized by its elongated finial and the distinctive sausage turns in the back between the slats. This chair is part of a group of seating that we find from Dutch descendant folks who were in New York and New Jersey. Chairs like this were known as great chairs in old inventories, denoting their significance and the high status of the patriarch who would sit in it. Despite its condition issue, this rare and cherished piece would retail for... For insurance purposes, a chair like this, I'm being conservative, would be $6,000. Wow. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise. It's not often we see a piece like this exquisite French platinum and diamond pin, which is a cherished family heirloom that dates back to the Art Deco period. The pin features over 200 beautiful rose-cut diamonds that amounts to a little over two carats in total. I like costume jewelry. That's my gig. 
And I see pieces that are copies of this. Oh. But rarely do I find the authentic piece. While the exact maker is unknown, its craftsmanship and design clearly mark it as an authentic piece from France. Despite being rarely worn, this piece is still admired for its elegance and beauty. However, due to its intricate design and high quality diamonds, it's valued at... Well, on today's market, I would say retail value between six and $8,000. That's nice. And so many diamonds too. Wow, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Found a treasure in the attic. It's a colorful etching by Salvador Dali. Got it in 1980 for just $250. It's part of a series called Song of Songs of Solomon. Typically, the individual prints were not signed by Dali. But there's a tiny problem. It has a suspicious signature. The signature actually lowers the value because it seems fake. That's also a huge red flag when it comes to the world of Dali prints. Well, here's a crazy idea. Remove the signature to make it more valuable. A conservator can carefully erase it and clean the artwork. Surprise, it might be worth. At auction, I would estimate this at around $1,000 to $1,500. Wow, <laughs> okay. In the heart of 18th century French craftsmanship, art reached its zenith. Among its greatest achievements is this showcased violin. The guest purchased this violin while she was in college in 1968. And my instructor told me that I needed a better violin than the one I had, and we paid $600 for it. Crafted in Paris in 1861 by Jean-Baptiste Villaume, a renowned French luthier, businessman, and inventor. He started work in Paris about 1820. He died in 1875, and he was a really prolific maker. This violin stands as a testament to his skill. The violin is adorned with exquisite purfling at the corners and boasts a rich reddish varnish. Additionally, the strings and the tuning pegs are still in remarkable condition. One cannot overstate the desirability of this French violin. At auction, it would retail at... Value this violin in the retail market today at $25,000. Oh wow, that's great, that is great. This guest inherited this piece from her grandfather, who acquired it during his visit to China. This vase was my grandfather's. Uh, he visited China for over a year in the 1920s. This is a porcelain vase made by the Japanese ceramist Miyagawa Makuzu Kozan. Kozan was one of the major potters of the Meiji era and was an appointed artist to the Japanese imperial household. This vase is one of his masterpieces, showcasing his sheer brilliance. It features a central motif of plum blossom design and general embossing throughout, typical of the ancient Chinese style work he did early in his career. The bottom of the vase bears his name, expressed in Chinese characters. And what it says is Dai Nippon Kozan Skuru, meaning that it was made by Kozan in Great Japan. Dating back to the 19th century, this vase created by the Japanese icon is valued at... ten dollars to $12,000. Oh my goodness. Wow. This guest purchased this piece at a sale in Montana. This one I saw at the Goodwill in Billings, Montana, in the early 90s. And you paid how much for it? Five bucks. This work of art is known as a Teco Pottery Vase made by the American Terracotta Tile and Ceramic Company, founded in 1881 in Terracotta, Illinois. Teco pottery is popularly known for its smooth, microcrystalline matte Teco green glaze with the typical sterling hallmark at the bottom of the vase. This piece is a perfect example made in 1905. Presented in perfect condition, this vase will sell at an auction for... Uh. And it's more like three to $4,000 realistically. This is quite the bangle to be handed down from mother to daughter. The bangle is a beautiful piece of jewelry and it is made from silver. It was crafted by an expert jewelry maker named William Spratling. This was one of William's earliest designs and it is quite exquisite. He is the father of the Tashko Mexico School of Mexican Artisanal Silver Jewelry. What's most alluring about this jewelry is that it's called the River of Life and a close look at it shows how it represents a flowing river. 
It's a great piece of jewelry that was made in the 1940s. If this alluring band were to auction today, it would retail at the price of... I would give it an estimate of $1,000 to $2,000. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. The guest brought the Chilcat blanket his family owned for several generations. It was originated from Skagway and made between the late 1890s and 1920s, taking months to complete. The guest's great-grandmother received it as a wedding gift or purchased it from a native lady. The blanket was made from mountain goat hair and spun cedar bark, feeling soft despite its rugged materials. The Chilcat people wove the blanket, featuring crests like a coat of arms representing the family's identity. The design included ravens, bears, and other figures with a beautiful blue color, likely commercially dyed. The blanket has faded slightly over time, but the original color is still visible on the reverse side. Due to its cultural significance and condition, the appraiser estimated its value at... It is not an adult-sized blanket. It's a smaller blanket, probably for a youth. If this were to come up at auction, I would say probably $25,000 to $30,000. Wow, that's, that's a lot more than I thought it was going to be. It's culturally a significant piece. What's special about this item is that it looks like both a vase and a bowl. This is a spectacular piece of art that we don't see very often. This vessel was crafted in Ohio around the 1900s, and the vessel is quite a rare item. Luelsa is the name of this line. Luelsa is usually a brown glazed piece. It is beautified using a variety of designs on the surface. The vessel is a blue glazed work of art, and from it there is a shine that exudes the utter magnificence of the piece. Because of its beauty, this vessel would probably fetch an auction price of... And the value of this is about a thousand dollars. No way! way. The first thing you notice about this photograph is its size. It looks like an ordinary photograph, but it's quite rare because it was taken during the mass of Pope John Paul II. The photograph shows over 300,000 people and it was taken in 1987. This beautiful photograph was taken by Eugene Goldbeck. Eugene was a top photographer because he captured the beauty of different locations in his photographs. And what he did was do these large panoramas. He traveled to Egypt, he went to Paris, he went to Peru and photographed some of the really important areas. At an auction, this beautiful photograph would retail for... Would sell for $1,000. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for bringing it in. Thank you very much. The guest brought the pottery vase she received as a gift from a family friend who acquired it during his travels. The vase was identified as Amphora Teplitz pottery from the Tern Teplitz region of Bohemia. The pottery was made by Reisner, Stellmacher, and Kessel, a company founded in 1892 and won a Best in Show prize at the 1893 World's Fair in America. The imperial mark on the bottom indicated that the artisan graduated from the Imperial Technical School. The vase was made between 1905 and 1910, as indicated by the Austria and Amphora marks. It was a prime example of Art Nouveau pottery with a unique double-necked ring shape. The vase features an elephant design, making it appealing to elephant collectors. This enchanting vase, belonging in a league of its own, was valued at... Typically at auction, these pieces sell for between five, seven hundred dollars all the time. We have come to the conclusion would not surprise us if this piece brought somewhere between two thousand and three thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> He's probably going to want it back now. <laughs> The guest brought a bronze statue of Guan Yin she acquired at an estate auction in Jerome, Idaho. She made bid on the statue after missing out on other desirable items. The pre-sale estimate for the statue was two to four thousand dollars, but she purchased the statue for only three hundred fifty dollars, a fraction of its current worth. The statue was identified as an 18th century bronze cast with silver inlays, signed by Yutong Shurso, a Chinese monk. It depicted Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy, in a pose of royal ease, with attributes like a scroll and a vase. The appraiser praised the statue's beauty, particularly the face, which was classic 17th or 18th century. 
Transforming a humble auction find into a precious treasure, this beautiful statue was appraised at. So it was estimated at two to four thousand. Yes. Well, guess what? Now it would be worth somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> my goodness. At auction. Oh my so goodness. So if it went up for auction today, to right? Wow. The guest brought a painting purchased by her mother in Nashville, Tennessee, where she met the artist David Berliuk and his wife. Berliuk was a Russian-born artist who studied in Russia, Paris, and was part of the Blue Rider group with Kandinsky and Paul Klee. Berliuk was a Fauvist painter, poet, and art critic who was kicked out of the Moscow Institute for being too avant-garde. He traveled extensively and eventually settled in the United States, where he painted genre scenes like the one the guest brought. The painting was rare because much of Berlioz's early work was destroyed during the Russian Revolution. The painting was on board and likely featured a frame made by the artist himself. The guest's mother purchased the painting in 1961 for $300 and it had never been appraised. Due to Berlioz's popularity among Russian collectors, this unique and valuable piece of art history was valued at... I think that you would have to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000. Really? Oh, yes. I can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. The guest brought a 1950s Louisiana Hayride program with autographs from Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. The autographs were obtained by the guest in person in 1955. The guest was 16 years old at the time and attended the Louisiana Hayride show with friends. Elvis and Johnny Cash were not yet famous, and the guests described them as really handsome and good-looking. The autographs were early examples and differ from the signatures that became familiar later in their careers. It was a historic program because it predated the Million Dollar Quartet recording session and featured two country music legends. The Louisiana Hayride was a launching pad for many country artists' careers, making this program a unique piece of music history. This extraordinary find, procuring the autographs firsthand, made the program more authentic and valuable, and it was valued at... Uh, at auction for the program, I would put between five and seven thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, really? I had no idea. Have you ever seen a silk tapestry that seemed to shift between day and night as the light changes? This guest brought in what they believed was a 400-year-old tapestry from Beijing, China, purchased by their aunt in 1934. They were curious if the scene depicted night or day, since the light created a moonlit appearance. The appraiser explained that the tapestry's monochromatic appearance made it difficult to discern the scene. Originally, the silk threads were dyed in bright colors, but these dyes faded over time and exposure to sunlight. The piece featured a small orb, likely the moon, with a river view and a rustic hut amidst a bamboo grove below. The appraiser clarified it wasn't a tapestry, but rather an embroidery, with threads sewn onto a silk backing. Although bought in China, it was of Japanese origin, popular in Japan during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The piece was estimated to be from around 1900 to 1920, as the expansive landscape view became prevalent in Japan only in the 20th century. Despite some damage, the appraiser advised against any restoration, noting it was in acceptable condition. The piece was valued by the appraiser as follows. I would say if we sold this at auction, it would make somewhere in the order of about $1,500 to $2,500, maybe two to $3,000. Well, somewhere that's great. It could be worth as much as six to $8,000 if it were in pristine condition with vibrant colors. Walk through Boston's history with its revolutionary reminders. Visit the Granary Burying Ground where victims of the Boston Massacre rest. Appraiser Wes Cowan joined me at the Old State House to discuss some lesser known details of this revolutionary print. Paul Revere's famous print, The Bloody Massacre, fueled anti-British sentiment. Why wouldn't you call it Paul Revere's print? Well, Revere copied this print from a fellow artist and engraver here in Boston named Henry Pelham. Pelham was furious. He called it the most dishonorable thing anyone could do. The print shows a dramatic scene, but it wasn't entirely accurate. Revere knew it would spark emotions and maybe make him some money. 
Only a few of Pelham's have survived. Revere's print is much more valuable, fetching over. So 150 to north of $200,000. Pelham's rarer print might still be worth. To come up at auction, I would expect it to have an estimate of at least 50 to $70,000. We are presented with a white bear doll inherited by the guest from her mother. This is a Stife teddy bear. My mother gave him to me. I was collecting toys at one time. This is a Stife white clown bear dating back to the early 20th century. Created by the German-based toy company Stife, founded by Margaret Stife, this piece features the characteristic double F underlined button in its ear, typical of Stife's earliest works. Remarkably, it still has the original tag, which is often missing in most Stife bears. The bear also has glass eyes, an upgrade from the first shoe button eyes. Although it retains its original clown hat, it is missing the ruff around its neck. Requiring significant restoration to return it to its original white color, this Stife bear will be an auction special worth somewhere between $25 and $3,200. So oh, okay. he's a delight. Regarded as the Cadillac of mechanical dolls, my husband has an aunt, Betsy, and uh, she has, over the years, collected automata dolls. And she was very nice and generous and gave me this doll for Christmas two years ago. This Jumeau automaton doll is truly a remarkable piece. The Jumeau company, renowned for their French mechanical dolls, created this exceptional automaton between 1880 and 1905. Unlike many similar dolls, where the mechanism is housed in a box, this doll's mechanism is ingeniously integrated into the torso itself. What sets this doll apart is its adult-like head with an open mouth showing teeth, a rare and distinctive feature. There's a key underneath the skirt here, and then there's this lever that you pull out, and then we can see it operate. The doll's head, arms, and chest plate are made of bisque. Given its unique automation and adult-like features, it is valued at... On the retail market, we're talking about thirty dollars to $35,000. And she gave this to me? And oh my goodness. <laughs> Exhibited on the show is a meticulously crafted glass vase. This exquisite vase was inherited by the guest from her mother. And my grandmother, recalled to Granny, said, you know, these are things I'm just giving away. And Mom looked and she says, um, yeah, could I have that, please? It bears the signature of its renowned maker, René Lalique, a celebrated French jeweler, medalist, and glass designer. This particular piece, named Bouchardon, is in honor of an 18th century French sculptor. Edme, E-D-M-E, okay. Bouchardon, whose works are in the Louvre and many other museums, and he was a sculptor, he was a draftsman, he was a painter, he favored the classical figure. Crafted in 1926, the vase was intricately made by casting three parts separately, then assembling them together. The vase features two beautiful handles designed as female figures holding a festoon of flowers, enhancing its elegance. Given its stunning Art Deco style and the esteemed reputation of its maker, this vase is estimated to be worth... Probably between six and $8,000 in a retail store. I'm upping my insurance. <laughs> this guest bought this piece from his friend, who was retiring. A fellow worked with me. He was 74 years old and he was retiring. His mother-in-law had died and his wife had died and he had two houses to clean out. I'm a train collector and he wanted to know if I wanted to buy one of the trains. Along with some train sets, he got them all for $200. This is a complete Ferris wheel set made by a company named Dahl. Based in Germany, Dahl produced many wonderful items, including this Ferris wheel, which was designed to be run as an accessory to a steam engine. Presented in mint condition, this piece has everything intact, with all the figures and mechanisms dating back to 1904. A rare and unique steam-powered Ferris wheel in such condition will sell at auction for... At an auction, I think it would probably sell in the range of uh, eight to $12,000. Oh. An unexpected gift. This tile panel was found hanging over the fireplace of the newly purchased house of this guest. It has caster wheels attached to it, making it mobile. 
by the American Encaustic Tile Company of Zanesville, Ohio, this panel is particularly unique because of its overall large size and size of individual tiles. Usually, if you have a large panel made up of tiles, they're all six inches, almost all the time. Six inch square. Six inch square. Yeah. Another unique property of this tile panel is the style of the painting used. Most panels are usually decorated in a Victorian American encaustic style. This, however, is painted in the Delft style. And I don't know if you're familiar with Delft. It's a, of it. it's a city uh, in Holland. Oh, They've been okay. producing uh, pots and tiles, mm -hmm. and mostly tin glazed in blue and white, just like this. This is America's encaustic version of the famous Delft tiles. The company's mark is seen on the back of this detachable tile, and this lovely work of art is valued at about... I would value this at somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000. Hmm. Not bad. A good old jolly Toby jug makes his way to the show. This guest brings this Toby jug, which has been in her family for over 200 years. Toby jugs, also known as Toby mugs, are famous pottery jugs modeled as a seated figure or head of a recognizable person. These jugs were originally made in England in the 18th century. This particular jug is believed to be an early piece dating to around the 1800s. First of all, I can feel it's very lightweight, and that's typical of the early one. It doesn't happen after the first period, because it's made of something called pearl glazed earthenware, which is very thinly potted. The use of this pearl glazed earthenware was stopped around the 1830s. Also, the characteristic bluish tint of pearl glazed earthenware is present. Now, wherever the glaze collects, which it's done around the eyes and in the furrows of the brow here and in the mouth, you can see in the thicker part of the glaze it's bluish. These tints are absent in later productions in the late 19th and 20th centuries. These features indicate that this is an early Toby jug. It is in pristine condition for a piece this old, and it is valued at about... A diamond in the rough, this chair was given to this guest by a friend as appreciation for helping clean out his father's house. Although in terrible condition, this is a rather fascinating piece. It is called a 45 chair. It was made by the Danish designer Finn Yule. Yule is considered to be the best Danish designer of all time. Known for his furniture design, he was the designer who introduced Danish modern to America. This is one of his unique creations. So when he came out with this chair, it was almost controversial. It was one of those things that smacked people really hard and people had to rethink the way they, they looked at furniture. He also began the use of teak and it became very popular with Danish furniture makers. It is in terrible condition and this significantly affects its value. It, however, can be restored to its original condition. In this state, it is valued at about at auction is probably worth between four and six thousand dollars. Wow, I didn't think so. Yeah, that's that's, that's what wonderful. it is. In 2022, its value rose to between eight and ten thousand dollars. What do you think the value would be today? Let me know in the comment section. We have here a brown bookcase with an exquisite historic appeal. The guest's husband inherited this piece of furniture from his grandparents to my husband's grandparents from California. They built their house in the 1900s. This bookcase was made during the early 20th century arts and crafts movement in 1915 by Gustav Stickley, an American furniture maker whose designs influenced American craftsman architecture. We see the brand mark on the back of the bookcase, which includes a burned-in logo with Gustav Stickley's name, proving it's one of his later works. And the mark that we have here is a later mark. The construction uses mortise and tenon joints, which are strong and show Stickley's craftsmanship. Despite the lesser fame of Gustav's later works, this piece is in excellent condition. In pristine condition, this remarkable bookcase, which reflects the heritage of American arts, could sell for... Auction today, this bookcase, probably bring between $4,500 and $6,500. Uh, I'm really surprised. This painting is quite an old but uniquely beautiful piece. It can be attributed to the design expertise of Cubans. The painting was created by the expert Cuban painter René Porto Carrero. The painting was made in 1960. 
Rene Porter Carrero, a Cuban artist, he started at an academy but found the art school much too confining, so it's amazing. Rene is quite gifted, and not just in painting, but also in activities like sculpting. The patterns on the painting are quite distinct, which is what makes it particularly appealing. This painting is a perfect representation of abstract and modern art. The painting itself is signed, dated, and inscribed with the title on the back. And in English, it's called the Cathedral. At auction, this beautiful oil-on-canvas abstract painting would retail for... If this were in a gallery, it would be priced in the range of eighty to $100,000. Oh my gosh. When you look at these beautiful paintings, you realize that there's one thing they have in common. They were all created by the Taos tribe. It's quite rare to see a group of superior artists who paint so well, but the Taos are a different breed entirely. There's quite an interesting story of how Taos paintings came to be in America. Ernest Blumenschein was sent uh, to the Southwest in 1896 on an illustration assignment from McClure's magazine. In 1915, after realizing the Taos were a remarkable people, the Taos Society of Artists was established. When you look at this Taos painting, you'd realize the sheer expertise that exists within the tribe. And he is eclipsing White Sun, the elder. You see that not only in the, the placement in the painting. At auction, these beautiful tribal art paintings usually retail between... ...is generally between about three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000 in the private market. It's quite rare to see paintings that are this realistic. This painting represents the work of Alaskan culture. It was drawn by expert painter Fred Mokatons. Fred was highly specialized in depicting Alaskan scenes, and this painting represents one. Well, Fred Mokatons was born in 1908 in Ohio. He studied in the Midwest, and then in 1935, he intended to make a brief visit to his uncle in Alaska, but he ended up staying for two years. He was known as a colorist because his paintings were well colored. When you look at this painting, you will see that it took quite the work to create. One of his big influences was another American artist named Maxfield Parrish. And they had a similar technique, which was to use an underglaze in the case of this. It was an ultramarine blue. The painting also has a characteristic luminous glow. At auction, this beautiful Alaskan painting would fetch a price of... I think if this were to sell in a retail gallery today, it might be for about $25,000. Really? Yeah. The guest brought an artwork they owned for 45 to 50 years, stored under her bed. It was kept under the bed because the guest didn't like snakes. The artwork was by Fred Cabote, a Hopi artist, and depicted Hopi snake dance. Fred Cabote was a celebrated Hopi painter, silversmith, illustrator, potter, author, curator, and educator. The snake dance was considered sacred and not meant to be depicted, making this artwork bold and rebellious. Fred Cabote was born into a culturally connected Hopi family at Shang Opavi, Second Mesa, Arizona. The artwork's significance and rarity contribute to its high value, being appraised at... If this came up for sale today at an auction, I think it would easily bring $2,500. Well. Just in a minute. 